I worked at a Dairy Queen on the border of rural and suburban Pennsylvania. Uh, and there, most of us were high school and college students. Uh, we you know, bonded pretty well. We were mostly friends. Um, and we bonded over our shifts and you know, making ice cream together uh, through those hot summer months. Uh, and one day, uh, one of my coworkers asked me uh, if I ever had dog before. And I thought that was a weird way to phrase the question, but I responded enthusiastically. Uh, I have my pet dogs, Daisy and Oliver. Um, they're my favorite. Daisy loves to pl play tug of war and Oliver loves to fetch. Um, I know this is a weird way he phrased it, but you know, when I answered his question, you know, uh, and I'm a dog person too, so I get super excited to talk about him. Um, and you know, when I answered his question, he seemed confused uh, and took a step back and rephrased his question. Uh, and he asked, no, have you ever eaten dog before? And when he asked the question, again, I was taken back. All these feelings of anger and rush to me and frustration. Why would you ask such a dumb question like that? I just told you how much I love my pet dogs, you know, Daisy and Oliver. Why, why would you ask me that? Uh, and so I realized in the tone that he asked me before I started to respond. And he was serious. He was actually curious. And it wasn't to, you know, make me mad or, you know, anger me in any way. He was legitimately curious. And so I composed myself and I listened. And so when I started to listen, we shared ideas. And you know, he shared with me what he thought of Asian Americans and uh, different stereotypes that he had. And one of those being about me. Uh, and I had to dispel some of his theories that no, the Chinese restaurant inside of our little strip mall you know, did not serve dog. And so you know, this was a hard conversation for me. And it bothered me a lot. Um, but as I thought and reflected, I couldn't blame him. And at the same time, it really did, it really did bother me. Um, we kept talking and talking, and when I started to reflect, I realized that his perspective on me was as someone who is a foreigner, someone who could not be American, and it simply I was misunderstood because of my race. And so he was using uh, the perpetual foreigner stereotype. And so the perpetual foreigner stereotype is this idea that Asian Americans uh, and other immigrants from other communities um, can't be ever considered fully American. Uh, and so it's best summarized in this one question and phrase, where are you really from? And so if you're from an immigrant community or from the Asian American Pacific Islander community, you may have heard this question, you, know, you may have been asked, and it's often in efforts to figure out why you're not white. And so when people ask me, where are you really from, I typically answer and try to play a little game and challenge their expectations. Uh, and I do so by telling the truth. And so when people ask me, where are you really from, I'll tell them, Pennsylvania, born and raised. Uh, and then, you know, unsatisfied, they'll ask where my parents are from. Uh, and I'll tell them, Queens, New York. Uh, and so we'll keep going down this line to my grandparents in efforts to figure out why I'm not white or what kind of Asian I am. And then, then in there, I get, they get their answer. Um, but it reinforces this idea that my family, me, none of us are considered full Americans because we will always be considered perpetually foreign. Um, and it, it still stuck with me. Um, and this is something that many other communities face and focus on. And when I began to think and realize why was I misunderstood, uh, and I realized that my coworker misunderstood me because of my race, because I was Asian, and this identity group that I belonged to. And as the 2016 election unfolded, I began to keep on reflecting on why people misunderstand each other, and, and why is it because of these you know, different identity groups we belong to. Uh, and I came to this conclusion that, um, that during this election, it, this was more than just whether or not I was being misunderstood because I was Asian, but also it could apply to political sides too. Um, and so I'm from Chester County, Pennsylvania. Uh, it's a beautiful Philadelphia suburb. It's very politically diverse. Uh, we have acres and acres of farmland, uh, especially for mushrooms in the Pennsylvania Amish, uh, urban areas with a big state school, um, and sprawling suburbs and cookie cutter neighborhoods. Uh, and so all, of these, all this diversity, maybe not racially, but this diversity, created a political, contested political climate. And during the 2016 election, the tension, you could feel it in the air. All of our conversations were dominated by the political tension between conservatives and liberals. It seeped through our dinner tables, everything. 
and it was just astonishing to see the effect that political polarization had had on our town, ripping it apart. And I began to think, how have we gotten here? And why, if we're all Americans, why are we so divided? And this political division really continued to bother me. And so I asked myself, why do we feel so much distance and frustration towards each other from different parties? And what does this, you know, what does race have to do with political polarization? You know, especially the division between our own families and our own neighbors. And surely we, we all just want the, what's best for our country. And we, I came to the answer that it is our intolerance um, and our frustration with each other. And what happens is that we tend to divide ourselves into tribes and groups. And when you can separate yourselves from other people, separate us from them, and put them into different tribes, then it's so much easier to have hate and antipathy for those people outside of your own tribe. And so someone who well summarized this political division, his name is David Wasserman, a political journalist, and uh, he described it as the battle between Whole Food shoppers and Cracker Barrel patrons. And so what I thought was so interesting about his description of the 2012 election between Mitt Romney and uh, then President Obama was how accurate it was. And so he collected his data, and through the data you can see that people who live by Whole Foods, Urban Outfitters, Lululemon, and Apple stores, they tended to elect Democrats, whereas people who lived by Cracker Barrel, Tractor Supply Company, Hobby Lobby, and Bass Pro Shops, they typically elected Republicans. Uh, and I kept thinking about how powerful David Wasserman's words were and how much they resonated with me, because it shows how our non-political identities and affiliations are aligning with our political ones. And uh, author Ezra Klein, uh, who is the co-founder uh, and former editor-in-chief of Vox, in his book, Why We're Polarized, he talks about Whole Foods and explains how Whole Foods is this place where it's very vegan and vegetarian friendly. Uh, there are many different options and uh, different ethnic cuisines, and it really pushes you out of your comfort zone to try new things. Uh, whereas Cracker Barrel is this place uh, where it's steeped in tradition and the same comfort foods that are always be there for you and it's reliable. And so he talks about and explains how our psychologies influence our brand preferences. So if your psychology is more open and fluid, you may prefer Whole Foods versus if your psychology is more uh, seeks change, or seeks fear, no, excuse me. If it fears change and seeks stability, then you may prefer Cracker Barrel. And so as our psychologies and our identities and um, our preferences and different lifestyles, as they align and sort themselves into different poles, this is what our new political polarization is becoming. And these polls are our mega identities, uh, which was crowned by uh, Lillian Mason, uh, an author and professor at the University of Maryland. And so what was so interesting about the Whole Foods and Cracker Barrel example is that I saw these two types of people. Now, if I describe someone um, who shops at Whole Foods, maybe drives a Prius, eats avocado toast every day in the morning and does yoga classes and recycles, you may assume that they're a liberal. And if I describe someone who maybe drives a pickup truck, goes to Cracker Barrel, and likes to hunt, you might think of them as conservative. Uh, and so I lived with both of these types of people. Uh, and to some extent, I might be both. Um, and you know, they all met together in Chester County when, and they clashed when we weren't living our separate lives. Uh, and so you know, back to Chester County, you can see that Cracker Barrel and Whole Foods, they're just three miles apart on the same road, uh, showing how weird my town is. Uh, and you can divide, define political polarization uh, as the clustering of these identities, opinions, and affiliations among two different poles. Um, and polarization itself isn't necessarily bad, but what is dangerous is the type of division we have today. Uh, it is you know, driven and sorted so clearly, like never before in the history of the American electorate. Uh, and you have these mega identities that makes it so threatening. And so in other ways we can see this division is how we've stigmatized the other party. And so in 1994, 21% of Republicans had unfavorable views of Democrats, and 17% of Democrats held unfavorable views of Republicans. And fast forward to 2016, that's increased to 58% and 55% respectively. Uh, and another metric we can look at is in 1960, 5% of Republicans and 4% of Democrats said they would be displeased if their child married someone outside of their political party. 
Uh, and then 50 years later, that has increased to 49% of Republicans and 33% of Democrats. You know, this change is so drastic and how much we stigmatize, we fear the other party and how our identities are diverging. And so if we look at our mega identities, we can see that we have both a liberal and a conservative, a lean Republican and a lean Democrat. And all these different de uh, demographics and demographic groups are aligning among them. And so we can use polling data to see how they've separated. And it's important to note that none of these demographics are monolithic, and the story is always more complicated and nuanced than that. Um, but it's important to see that you may identify with many of these identities. I certainly do. Uh, and they may be across the line or all on one side. Uh, and it's so interesting how stark that these identities are sorting themselves among different political parties. Um, and that is quite frankly concerning. Um, and if we go to the next slide, we'll see that 77% of Republicans and Democrats say that not only do they disagree over plans and policies, but they also disagree on basic facts. And if we disagree on basic facts, it is concerning because as a democratic society, we do need a mutual understanding of the same basic facts and reality in order to function uh, and solve the issues at hand. And there are so many issues at hand. Uh, and I think a place we can start to move forward. Uh, it's not a silver bullet by any means. And you know we will need policy and reform to move forward. Um, but what we can all do as individuals is focus on the way we perceive others. And that is really important. And so what gets in the way of the way we perceive others is our stereotypes and stigmas that we hold for other people and the contempt we hold for groups outside of our own. Now, these stereotypes and stigmas, they harm us on an individual level, entire demographics, and everyone as a whole. On an individual level, we can go back to my days at Dairy Queen, uh, where my coworker stereotyped me. Um, and you know, when you stereotype someone or you stigmatize them, and reduce them to that single narrative or story. You're essentially removing who they actually are and the reality from your perception. And that creates this distance. And with that distance, you can cast them as other or a part of a different tribe. And then you can use you know, hate and antipathy so much eat more. And entire demographics. If we look at Asian Americans and the perpetual foreigner stereotype, you know, in the past year uh, and since the beginning of the pandemic, Asian Americans uh, have taken the blame of the coronavirus pandemic. So much of our frustration from the way the virus has disrupted our way of life is being misdirected towards them and stigmatizing them as the cause and carriers of COVID. And since then, there have been about 3,800 anti-Asian incidents recorded in just the United States alone. Mm -hmm. And some of these inc instances include you know, being called the coronavirus or uh, being attacked and harassed and you know, saying that these people can take COVID back to China, being attacked, being assaulted, uh, stabbed, lit on fire, shot, and killed. And this is all because of our stigmatization of Asian Americans and how we've casted them as the cause of the coronavirus through our rhetoric and through our history. And so it's easy to attack Asian Americans because they're already otherized. They're already seen as perpetual foreigners or the El Peril, but not one of us. And so the way that stereotypes and stigmas and our intolerance of other groups affect all of us as a whole is they complicate our ability to connect with each other. It allows identity to be become not a strength, but a barrier between ourselves. And that is incredibly dangerous. You know, life is not a zero-sum game where you win at the detriment of your opponents, especially if, if your opponents are simply your neighbors and your fellow Americans. You know, in order to move forward, we really must come together and we cannot continue uh, to let our different identity groups divide us in such a pluralistic and democratic society. And I do have some steps to move forward. Uh, and these are steps that every individual can take to work on the way we perceive each other. Um, and the first way is to start consuming stories. Uh, where the main characters don't look like you. And 
a great way to do this is through books and poetry, um, but if you're bad at reading sometimes, like me, uh, a great way is through streaming services as well. Um, and another thing we have to do is mix up the type of media, informative media that you consume. And so this is a great opportunity to support local journalism and publicly funded programs. Um, for instance, you know, social media uh, is where a lot of us get our news, and the algorithms are designed to show you what you want to see. So break free from that. Uh, challenge your perspectives. Uh, another way to do that is by, when permissible, travel with the intent to learn about the local people and culture. And don't forget to reflect. And by doing so, consciously commit yourself to becoming better and not allowing these stereotypes and stigmas to act as barriers between us. And you know, in doing so, you can establish a growth mindset and because it's okay not to be perfect, as long as we're better than yesterday. And if we seek friendships with people from those who are from different groups than us, who hold different identities, that can be a great bridge builder that's incredibly powerful. And I'm not saying be friends with people because of an identity group they belong to, but having a diverse group of friends and having those tough conversations with them. And when having those conversations, it's important to make sure to listen, not to respond, but to understand. And so I hope that I can bring to your attention how our identities are being divided amongst us and how we must be able to use diversity as our strength in moving forward in our very polarized and divided society. Thank you.